Hello, friends, and welcome to the National Constitution Center and to this evening's convening of America's Town Hall. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Let's inspire ourselves for the learning ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the U.S. Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. Before we begin, let me plug our next town hall program on July 13th. We'll host our 2023 annual Supreme Court review in partnership with the Anti-Defamation League. This is a superb review of the major decisions of this significant term. And you can register at constitutioncenter.org forward slash town hall. Please also be sure to check out our We the People podcast uh, over the next couple of weeks, which is covering the end of term decisions as, lot, as well as many other uh, fascinating and important historical debates. Um, friends, it's such a pleasure to convene four of America's greatest scholars of Montesquieu to discuss his influence on the founders. I'm so looking forward to learning from them and to sharing their, their wisdom with you. And I'll introduce them and we'll jump right in. William Allen is Emeritus Dean and Emeritus Professor of Political Philosophy at Michigan State University. He is an editor and translator of a forthcoming new edition of Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws. Congratulations to Professor Allen for that uh, important achievement. And he's also the writer and author of, of books of political theory of coruscating and illuminating um, brilliance, which always teach so much about the founding. Thomas Pangle is co-director of the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Study of Core Texts and Ideas, and he holds the jo Joe R. Long Chair in Democratic Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author of superb books, including Montesquieu's Philosophy of Liberalism, The Theological Basis of Liberal Modernity in Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws, and his newest book is The Life of Wisdom in Rousseau's Reverie of the Solitary Walker. Oh, what a great topic. Can't wait to learn about that. Uh, Dennis Rasmussen is professor of political science at Syracuse University. He's the author of five books, including The Pragmatic Enlightenment, Recovering the Liberalism of Hume, Smith, Montesquieu, and Voltaire. Um, a just wonderful book that I must recommend to you, which is uh, Fears of a Setting Sun, which is about the founders and their optimism or pessimism about the future of the American experiment. And he's the author most recently of a new biography of Governor Morris uh, uh, called The Constitution's Penman, Governor Morris and the Creation of America's Basic Charter, which I am very much looking forward to discussing uh, here as well. And Diana Schaub is Professor of Political Science at Loyola University, Maryland, and a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, she is the author of, uh, many, of, of, of many books, including Erotic Liberalism, Women and the Revolution, and Montesquieu's Persian Letters. And her newest book is His Greatest Speeches, How Lincoln Moved the Nation, uh, a, a wonderful book, which we've discussed before on uh, America's Town Hall. Welcome to all of you. Um, thank you so much for joining. And Professor Schaub, let me begin with you. Our, our initial goal and our introductory thoughts is to uh, introduce our audience to Montesquieu's influence. And you've identified at least two big ideas where he was central, um, his ideas about uh, federalism and about separation of powers. And you've also noted that he was the most cited founder in the, in the founding era. Uh, the scholar Donald Lutz has counted up the number of times the founders cited different thinkers and, and Montesquieu was absolutely number one on the list. So tell us why Montesquieu was so frequently cited and what his contribution to the founders was. Yeah, sure. Um, Montesquieu's masterwork uh, is The Spirit of the Laws, and it is a book for legislators. Uh, our founders were aware of that, and the architects of the American Constitution steeped themselves in it. 
Uh, it, yes, it's true. He is the most quoted authority in the Federalist Papers. Uh, he's appealed to by Alexander Hamilton in Essays 9 and 78, uh, and by James Madison uh, in numbers 43 and 47. Remember, they're both writing under the pseudonym Publius. Um, there are actual long, distinct quotations from Montesquieu in the Federalist Papers. Uh, very rare for them to quote from any other authorities, but there are long passages from Montesquieu. Uh, and I think he's actually cited on three different topics. So you've mentioned two of them, uh, the nature of Confederate republics, what we would now call federalism. So that's a question about the form of government. Uh, and then second, uh, the principle, or um, the, the uh, uh, Publius uh, calls it a maxim, uh, the maxim of the separation of powers. So that's really a point about the, the structure, uh, the, 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 the separation of powers, checks and balances. Uh, and then the third one, I think, is the character of the independent judiciary. Uh, this is an innovation that is very much associated with Montesquieu. Uh, so basically, there. I think they're reading the whole of the spirit of the laws, but uh, these three topics come from books 9, 10, 11, and 12, uh, really part two of the spirit of the laws. Uh, they describe Montesquieu in the most exalted terms. They call him the celebrated Montesquieu. Uh, he's elevated even further into the Empyrean when he is said to be the oracle who is always consulted and cited. Um, Oracle, I think, is the right word to describe his status. Uh, he's wise, but he is also cryptic. And he is so difficult to decipher that he was routinely appealed to by both sides in mm. the ratification debate. So I mentioned the Federalist use of him, but the Anti-Federalists were using him as well. And in fact, there was a battle going on between Federalists and Anti-Federalists to lay claim to the celebrated Montesquieu. Um, so uh, maybe just one more point about this, and you know, eventually we could maybe get into some of the details of the differences. But uh, in Federalist Papers 9 and 47, right after giving these long quotations from Montesquieu, uh, Publius presents his interpretation then of those Montesquieu passages in order to counter what he thought were anti-Federalist misreadings, mischaracterizations uh, propounded by anti-Federalist writers like Brutus and Cato. So uh, there really is, uh, it's an ongoing challenge for scholars of Montesquieu to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to endeavor in the first place to ascertain Montesquieu's meaning. So interesting. Thank you so much for summing up so well and for introducing the independent judiciary as a, as a third crucial influence of Montesquieu. And we'll look forward to delving into all of those three influences during our discussion. Uh, Dennis Rasmussen, in your book, The Pragmatic Enlightenment, Recovering the Liberalism of Hume, Smith, Montesquieu, and Voltaire, you argue that all, all three had a, had a pragmatic uh, quality, as, as, as your title suggests. Uh, what was distinctive about Montesquieu's vision that made him so influential for the founders? Well, I think Diane has done a great job of, of introducing this, the way he's cited on both sides, right? The both the proponents and the, the critics of the Constitution draw on Montesquieu. They both speak of him in such laudatory terms that it's um it's sometimes it's, it's very interesting that they they both take it to be a real challenge to wrestle with this very difficult thinker. And and they think, you know, they score real political points if they get Montesquieu on their side. Um Diana's right, I think, about the, the parts of Montesquieu that they emphasize most heavily. I think I'd say that the anti-federalists tend to focus more on the questions of federalism, what was sometimes called Montesquieu's law of size. So he claims pretty explicitly in I think his book eight, chapter 16, that republic, Republican governments need to be small in order to, to survive. And of course the anti-federalists like to cite that passage and say, well, we need to keep most of the power in the state governments on this more small local level. And the federalists really felt the need to play defense um, on, on that topic, whereas the Federalists love to cite Montesquieu's discussion of the Constitution of England and his arguments about the separation of powers, which they saw as very much instantiated in the Constitution. So they're, they're both drawing on Montesquieu. They're trying to pick and emphasize different elements of his, his thought and his, his legacy to, to further their own political ends. They each have, of course, counters to one another on, on both of these points. But I think that those, I would point to those as the main features that Again, the anti-federalists tend to draw on the, the question of the size, the potential size of republics, whereas the federalists tended to focus more on the question of the separation of powers. 
so interesting to note that um, different focus of, of the Federalist and Anti-Federalist. Uh, Professor Pangle, maybe let, let's take up the question of the size of the Republic because it's the most celebrated debate about Montesquieu. And as Dennis Rasmussen suggested, Montesquieu had suggested that republics could only thrive in small territories where people knew each other and could deliberate face to face. David Hume famously flipped that on its head and said that actually in larger republics, uh, factions were less likely to develop and therefore reason rather than passion could prevail. And Madison famously takes up Hume's uh, response to Montesquieu in, in Federalist 10. Tell us about that debate and the degree to which Montesquieu um, is invoked on both sides of it. Uh, yes, well, uh, Montesquieu is is famous for uh, stressing not only that a republic needs to be small, but above all, its animating principle and mainspring must be virtue, which is a very severe civic, Spartan Roman uh, subordination of individuals to the community, um, although with strong protections for the individuals as, as citizens. And he juxtaposes that not only with uh, the monarchy that prevailed in France of his own country, but of course the English system, which he uh, very highly regarded. And he spoke of England in a rather Delphic way as a republic that's hiding under the guise of a monarchy. So he does see in England a new kind of republic, very different from the classical republic. Uh, and really a republic that is a kind of mixture of monarchy and republicanism. The most republican feature of England, in his view, is the jury. The jury is democratic. And he conceives the judiciary in England as pretty much dominated by the jury, with the judges really being just kind of referees in the room. So that's quite different from the American judiciary, which Hamilton largely was responsible for designing, which is a kind of combination of what Montesquieu praised in England, very strong juries, so that, for example, uh, the anti-federalists appealed to Montesquieu to say that juries should have the final say law, as well as in the facts of the case, and they warned that under this new constitution, that would cease to be the case. Uh, Federalists claim, no, 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 we don't say anything about the jury. Um, uh, what Montesquieu, what, what the American judiciary really is, is a kind of synthesis of what Montesquieu admired in England, very powerful juries, and what he admired in France, which is what he called the nobility of the robe, the judiciary as a kind of aristocracy. And that was something that the anti-Federalists were very frightened by and opposed to and thought Montesquieu uh, was a hopeful indicator of a danger in the, in the United States. Hamilton, of course, defended that very strongly. One other important point that I would add to the mix, so to speak, is this. Perhaps the greatest theme of Montesquieu is commerce and commercialism. Mm -hmm. uh, is a great exponent of the beneficent effects and civilizing effects and humanizing effects of globalism and global commerce, but also commerce within countries. And he argues very strongly in his book on commerce that commerce, commercial powers naturally are at peace with one another. Now, the anti-federalists took that argument up and made it one of their strongest arguments for a much weaker central government. They said, we're all going to be commercial republics. And we know from Montesquieu, commercial republics more or less automatically remain at peace. So why do we need such a strong central government to keep us together? Now, in the Federalist Papers, Hamilton attacks that thinking very strongly and argues that's just not true. He doesn't mention Montesquieu. He knows very well that he's attacking Montesquieu. He keeps it completely quiet and acts as if he's just speaking on his own and argues, no, 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 commerce does not prevent wars. There are just as many wars between commercial powers and there always will be. And that is indeed something that Montesquieu said, no, that's simply not true that commercial 
wars are are much more peaceful and there's very little likelihood of war between them. So that was a very big kind of, you know, uh, dispute over a very important issue uh, that Montesquieu took one side of and the American founders led by Hamilton, of course, took the other side of and the anti-federalists uh, gathered around Montesquieu. Fascinating, that was so uh, illuminating that you added to our influences, uh, virtue and commerce, and you, you so well wove together the competing influences of, of, of France and England and um, the founders disagreeing ultimately about how each of those factors would or would not contribute to the success of a, of a, of a democratic republic. Professor Allen, I, I must begin, first of all, by congratulating you again by uh, for, for completing your new translation. I want to ask you what, what you learned from Montesquieu rereading re it and, and, and translating it. What 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 uh, struck you afresh at, at, in this uh, great act of uh, scholarship? And then maybe put on the table the, the factors, uh, uh, Professor Pangle, just in particular virtue. What was Montesquieu's notion of virtue and, and how did it influence the founders? Well, let me start at the beginning, the question of what struck me. Uh, I began my study of Montesquieu by standing in as a referee between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists and deciding the question, which best interpreted Montesquieu? I concluded that the Federalists had the better read. But that required a number of things that I had to see in order to arrive at that point. And it's not necessarily where I have, I still believe that is true, but something else has supervened since that time with regard to the central themes of the spirit of the laws. But in the context of resolving that, one of the things that came to light to me that was the most important was that you cannot read Federalist 10 without Federalist 9. Federalist 9 is a necessary introduction to Federalist 10. It sets the theme and the tone and the topic for Federalist 10, and it does so by relying upon Montesquieu, including the argument about faction and the argument that an extended republic will allow you to deal with the faction and Federalist 10 proceeds following that to show how it will deal with it. So those must be taken as a piece, which is important because they come from the two different authors, but it also signals the way in which the two are both one, Publius. So that what we find in settling the Federalist anti-Federalist dispute is a way to see through the constitutional arguments, which historically in the scholarship we've taken to be the center of the spirit of the laws. And that leads to the second thing that I discovered in the course of these 50 years of looking at it. I decided constitutionalism is not the main theme. And it's true you have to talk about virtue and commerce and religion and a few other factors equally importantly. But I think it is incontestably the case that the main theme is liberty and that there is abundant evidence throughout the text to demonstrate that, weaving through all these areas of concern that we have put on the table this evening, and which is why I describe him as offering a libertarian individualism. But it's focused on a principle that is really critically important. And if we go back to Federalist 9 again, and we can see where Hamilton quotes the spirit of the laws as to what the nature of the Confederated Republic is, he quotes une société de société, that French is, of course, well translated an assembly of societies. But we would do well to take it in the most literal form and say one society out of many societies, a pluribus unum. Because there is that dimension to Montesquieu's thought, a dimension which says, and this is the argument of the first nine page papers of the Federalist Papers, political homogeneity is possible without cultural homogeneity. And that's where commerce becomes so critically important. Because in talking about commerce, he's not talking merely about material interests, which is why he brings religion into the discussion of commerce. Yes, it's there in Book 24 in the Spirit of the Laws, but it's also present in the discussion of commerce because he's talking about the commerce of ideas. And he's confronting the Herodotian Herodoty challenge, whether in fact there can be such a thing as a universal religion whether you can carry on this intercourse of religious ideas to the point of disseminating them. This is all at the heart of the spirit of the laws. In that context, then, I read the constitutionalism 
as the instrumentality through which Montesquieu aims to achieve the broader vision that he enunciates in the larger work. Now, to go back to the beginning, I said liberty is the primary theme. That's not only because I've read the work more closely, but I read the first citation in the United States, which was not then the United States, but the colonies in 1754 in a freedom of the press case mm -hmm. in which Montesquieu's spirit of the laws is the text relied upon to defend the freedom of the press, liberty. And it continued from there into that period in which it was so frequently cited, as Diana has indicated, by the founding fathers. So 1754 was only six years after the work was first published in its original language. And that it's being quoted by an obscure printer in a Boston trial, someone who's not a Harvard faculty or not someone who is lettered and published in terms of treatises or theoretical accomplishments, indicates the depth to which Montesquieu had penetrated quickly and it only increased thereafter. So that what we're looking at, it seems to me, in talking about Montesquieu and the US Constitution, is a pervading influence that both gives us the key lexical vocabulary for describing our institutions and their relations with one another, and the deeper vocabulary for describing what it is that is aimed at through this republicanism. And what is aimed at is not the virtue of the small republic, though he certainly gives what sounds like almost uh, hagiographic praise of the virtue of the small republic early on, but that's not where he comes to rest. And when he closes book eight, he opens us to the fact that the small republic can't survive in a world of dangers. The world that George Washington describes in the farewell address where your cares, labors, and dangers are your constant partners. And that means he is searching for the alternative to the world of the small republic and the world, therefore, of rigorous virtue or self-renunciation. He's not discrediting virtue altogether. And as Tom Pinkle has written so well about and knows so very well, you can certainly see a little winking going on when he talks about virtue and when he distinguishes between political virtue and moral virtue. But that becomes not the issue at the heart of the spirit of the laws. The heart of the spirit of the laws is that point I made before, whether you can establish political homogeneity without insisting upon cultural homogeneity. At the end of the day, the work is meant to sustain that vision. And that, I think, is incorporated in what the Federalist Papers in, in particular, and Governor Morris far more dramatically understood and applied Montesquieu in that fashion. Wow, that was superb. Uh, just a magnificent uh, weaving together of Montesquieu's uh, focus on a commerce of ideas in making possible a, a political homogeneity without cultural homogeneity and that central focus on liberty and how interesting that he was cited as early as 1754 in that press case. Well. Well, you, all of you have just d d done such a, a a magnificent job in weaving together the different strands in Montesquieu's thought. Diana Shabal, I'll, I'll I'll ask you about the separation of powers in particular because it's the most obvious influence on the American Constitution. It has a long history back to Aristotle and the three types of government, uh, but Montesquieu had a distinctive influence. Um, uh, about the separation of powers and writing about the British Constitution, what precisely was Montesquieu's vision of the separation of powers that so influenced the founders? Uh, I will try to say something about that. Can I just very quickly respond to Bill? Please, please uh, do. Please maybe do. just uh, putting this in in, the, in, a, in a much more simplistic way. Uh, if you uh, take a look at the spirit of the laws, Book 11, Montesquieu says, is about the liberty with respect to the Constitution, Book 12 is about liberty with yeah. respect to the citizen. And you could actually uh, say that that point about liberty in the constitution, that is separation of powers and the teaching about the separation of powers, that's about structure. Uh, the liberty of the citizen, a uh, book 12, uh, turns out to be uh, an influence not on the original constitution, but on our bill of rights. 
Uh, in other words, uh, it, it is particularly concerned with the criminal law, things like due process, uh, rights of speech, rights of press, uh, opposition to cruel and unusual punishment, uh, the mildness and proportionality of punishment, uh, all of those things you can find in, in Book 12 on the li liberty with respect to the citizen. Um, yes, so then to, to go to the point about structure uh, and uh, Book 11, and that especially means Book 11, Chapter 6 on the Constitution of England and what Montesquieu draws from his study of that Constitution. Um, Publius is a good guide here. Uh, Publius says that this maxim or political truth is traceable to Montesquieu that, quote, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands whether of one, few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Uh, now, what the, uh, what the anti-federalists were charging is that this new constitution was guilty of that, guilty of uh, too much consolidation and of somehow violating the separation of powers. So Montesquieu, ha uh, 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 Publius has to explain how that is not so. And he finds that this maxim does not mean that the branches of government have to be utterly separate. They don't have to be completely non-touching, no overlapping, no blending of any kind. Instead, it turns out that to preserve the separation of powers in practice, certain departures from a purely functional separation of powers must be introduced. So this is easy enough to illustrate. Uh, take, uh, take the executive as created by our founders. Uh, they give the uh, executive a share in the legislative power through the executive veto. Uh, that is an artificial fortification of executive power. It is a violation of a very strict functional separation of powers, right? The executive is just to administer. Uh, why are you giving him, him a hand in the, uh, in the look, the, the final look of legislation? Uh, but uh, our founders argue that you have to artificially fortify the executive power to make it a match so that it can stand up to the naturally strong legislative power in any Republican order in a popular form of government, the legislature is naturally the most powerful branch. So we call that checks and balances, right? So separation of powers and checks and balances are not the same thing. Checks and balances are a kind of addition or even a departure from a strict separation of powers in order to preserve it in practice, these ingenious devices preserve the dynamic equilibrium of the separation of powers. So Publius throughout these essays uh, in, insists that a mere paper separation, in, in other words, one that you just declare uh, on, the, on the paper of the constitution itself, that's insufficient to actually preserve the separation of powers. So the constitution has to be such that uh, you are structuring the behavior of the office holders by means of the structure and powers of the various, uh, the various branches. So you strengthen the power of the executive by giving uh, the executive a veto. You'll attract more ambitious individuals to that office. Uh, and as Montesquieu first said, power must check power by the arrangement of things. And Publius uh, uh, paraphrases that and says, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. Great, now I understand that it wasn't just the separation of powers, it was Montesquieu's central contribution, but the checks and balances, as you said, what an amazing connection of that famous yeah, phrase. Although I, I do want to give our founders some credit here. Some of those checks and balances are of their own devising, uh, but it seems to me in fidelity to their understanding of, uh, of the separation of powers and, and what's requisite to it. Um, so, so that shows that, you know, they, they, they turn to Montesquieu for these principles, for these maxims, uh, and then they use their own prudence to um, to, to find what those, uh, what those mechanisms would look like in our particular order. Superb. Um, Dennis Rasmussen, any uh, further thoughts about the separation of 
power is based on what you've heard. And then I would love you to connect Montesquieu's writings on virtue with the amazing conclusion of your book on the founders and their uh, pessimism at the end of their lives, in many cases, about the future of the American experiment. You say, I'm going to read this passage from your book because it sums this crucial point up so well. You write, Washington had become disillusioned because of the rise of parties and partisanship. Hamilton, because he felt the federal government was not sufficiently vigorous or energetic. Adams, because he believed the American people lacked the requisite civic virtue for Republican government. And Jefferson, because of sexual division, sectional divisions that were laid bare by the conflict over the spread of slavery. This is a big question, but um, Montesquieu had a particular vision of virtue. The founders, what did the founders learn from Montesquieu about virtue? And how did they reach different conclusions about at the end of their lives about whether or not the American people had sufficient virtue to sustain the Republic? Right. So Montesquieu says that virtue it has to be the animating principle of Republican government. This tended to be more conducive to the anti-federalist vision who wanted, again, the government working on a much smaller, more local level. People would be very public spirited, dedicated to their community. I don't think the Federalists wanted to throw virtue aside entirely. I don't think it, they did see the Constitution as a machine that would run of itself, and, and there was just no need for civic virtue. But they placed less weight on it, I think, than the Anti-Federalists did. I think the Anti-Federalists saw it more civic virtue as almost an end in itself. This is how you measure, is it a good political order? Do the people exhibit this kind of public spiritedness? Whereas I think the Federalists tended to see it more as an end to a mean, it, sorry, a means to an end. Right, that you need these public spirited citizens at least to be vigilant enough about their liberties to elect good people right to, to allow the system to to run uh in my book i suggest that adams was of, of the major founders who we we tend to think of in the, the pantheon of the great founders had the greatest concern for civic virtue from the very beginning to the very end of his career um, he very much echoed montesquieu on this score saying the no, no government can last, no Republican government can last without sufficient virtue. In a monarchy, it's not as necessary. It's not the people who are governing after all. But if the people are self-governing, then you need them to be virtuous. Um, Adams was never sure that the people had the requisite virtue. He had you know, certain hopes from time to time, including right around the time of the drafting of the Constitution. He was in England, not, not in, in Philadelphia, of course, uh, but he, he seemed to have a kind of moment of hope right around 1787, 88. But really, for much of his career, he thought the American people weren't up to the task. Um, I will say the, the Federalists, one aspect of Montesquieu that we haven't yet touched on much, but I do think is related to this question of virtue, is the question of moderation. So Montesquieu says at one point, very late in the spirit of the laws, that he wrote the entire book to teach the legislator a spirit of moderation. He, he wants to moderate people's passions, ra moderate radical um, changes. Um, he encourages people to move slowly and gradually. This too is something that the anti-federalists thought they're on, si on Montesquieu's side with, right? They say, we want to reform the Articles of Confederation, certainly, most of them did, but they didn't want this radical overhaul with the Constitution, whereas the, the federalists had to, again, they're playing defense a little bit on this. They, they proudly uh, donned the mantle of innovators rather than being these kind of moderate conservative um, figures that many of the anti-federalists were. So, so they appealed once again to another part of Montesquieu. Um, the book is, of course, not called On the Laws, it's On the Spirit of the Laws. Um, and, and that means many different things, but he, he really emphasizes all the different factors, you know, history, custom, religion, climate, terrain, all the different factors that affect what the laws will be like and what the laws should be like, partly to teach this lesson of moderation. We shouldn't tinker too much with the political system because we know, we don't know how all the different factors are gonna influence one another. There could be unintended consequences. But the Federalists often appeal to what they called the genius or the character or the spirit of the American people, which they thought allowed this new constitute would allow this new constitution to work, that they, you could form a large Republic, which had never been done in the history of the world. Um, because of the, the special spirit or character of the American people. Um, and so that too, I think, related to their sense of the American people's virtue or, or capacity for, for virtue. So interesting. What a central point about Montesquieu teaching the spirit of moderation in the context of uh, talking about virtue. 
Uh, Professor Pangel, um, you've written about Montesquieu and the Roman influence. Uh, in the Cambridge Companion, you write about his uh, consideration on the causes and greatness of the Romans and their decline. Uh, describe the different conceptions of virtue. There's a Roman conception of mas using reason to master pas passion and achieving uh, self-mastery. A, a, a Christian conception, which invoked natural law and conscience uh, and, and uh, authority to uh, achieve virtue. And then this uh, Enlightenment vision, which emphasized commerce and interest as uh, something that would allow uh, passion to be the slave of reason, as Hume famously said, and put less of an influence on self navigation. Help us uh, put it in context. What was Montesquieu's take on virtue and how did it influence the founders? His great stress, as, as Dennis pointed out, I think very well, was on a, a very severe communal, anti-commercial, anti-individualist uh, civic virtue, as he saw in, in the great Greek and Roman cities. But there's a fascinating passage uh, sort of in the midst of his uh, hagiography, as Dennis put it, to the, uh, to the ancients, in which he says, uh, commerce its own virtues. And he, he lists a whole bunch of them, order, moderation, frugality, uh, reasonableness, and so on. And he says that once commerce is in, the, is in the spirit of a people, it takes over everything. So I think he quietly indicates there's a kind of um, balance or, or, or uh, uh, tension, if you will, between commerce, between virtue as it has predominated in history, and as he salutes it and has great admiration for it, and another kind of virtue, which I think you were sort of adumbrating and suggesting in your question, that uh, he sees operative more and more in England and and in other uh, you know parts of Europe, and that I think he has he has some hopes for as a kind of uh, um, self interest rightly understood, to use Tocqueville's famous phrase. Uh, a kind of enlightened and moderated uh, competitive commercial self-interest that he thinks uh, can uh, provide uh, a, uh, a not very uh, moralistic or high, but very solid support for uh, cooperation and, and patriotism and people understanding that their long-term interest is in supporting one another in a large commercial society with a rule of law and so on. Uh, it's so interesting and, and putting it that way in terms of enlightened, moderated commercial self-interest, self-interest rightly understood, ties it to Tocqueville and helps us distinguish it from the classical vision. Uh, Professor Allen, what do you want to tell us about what was distinctive about Montesquieu's vision of virtue? You used that amazing phrase, the the, the, the commerce of ideas, which Madison, I think, invoked a version of when in talking about the literati as a way of uniting public opinion. You've written about the influence of French thinkers of public opinion on Madison and tell us about how this aspect of Montesquieu influenced Madison and the founders. It's less clear that Montesquieu's response to this particular issue influenced Madison only because Madison himself distances himself from Montesquieu in his party press essays when he says we can't turn to Montesquieu as an example because he never lived in a republic. That's essentially what Madison said. And so, so we're not sure that we can trace Madison's views to Montesquieu. But we do know that in the essay on property, 1792, when, Montes when Madison lays out the comprehensive definition of property, and he says man not only has a right to his property, but a property in his rights. And those rights include the rights to conscience. He is there embracing the broader conception in the context of which we recognize the parameters of virtue as moral obligation. Now, we can see how this might resonate in Montesquieu by returning again to Book 11, Chapter 6 towards the end of which he makes perhaps the most extraordinary statement in the entire book. He says, every man thought to have a free soul ought to be self-governing. 
Those are the very words he uses. There's this description, therefore, of the free soul as the self-governing soul comes closer to describing what Montesquieu takes to be virtue, not in the sense of self-renunciation, but in the broader sense in which the human soul is capable of moderation, of self-governance. So that what we can say is that he has given us a broad range of principles that require to be, in some sense, coordinated in order to arrive at a clear constitutional argument. And I can illustrate this by going back to separation of powers for the moment, because I commit a great heresy in, in my commentary and translation of the spirit of the laws, and I depart from the usual language separation of powers. I introduce instead the language separation of authorities, because nothing is clearer than that Montesquieu distinguishes between power and the authority, the authority, the office holder. And there are two words in French which accommodate him, the word pouvoir, which is simply power, and the word puissance, which we often translate power, but also means authority. And in the critical passages in that book 11, chapter 6, the terms in which he uses puissance rather than pouvoir are absolutely critical to understand what he's talking about. So that what we're going to do is precisely control power by separating the authorities. Hence, we're not blending the powers, we're blending the authorities, and uh, which allows him to say, therefore, in this arrangement, nothing can be done at all unless they all do it together. No one of the branches or authorities is capable of accomplishing anything without the cooperation of the others. And that's how we got to checks and balances. And that's implicit in his account of the separation of authorities. Now, in all of this, what I'm trying to underscore is a simple proposition. The problem is power. The solution is the constraint upon power. The constraint upon power engages institutional architecture. It also engages reliance upon individual capacities. Thus, liberty is of critical importance. In that book 12, when we're talking about the liberty of the citizen, he makes it perfectly clear there could be no such thing as a thought crime. That really goes to the heart of all the distinctions he's making there. No such thing as a thought crime, which means, of course, that the individual retains the capacity of judgment and ought to retain a correlative capacity to act upon that judgment. Well, acting upon one's judgment as a self-governing soul requires that one act with appropriate prudence. And that may be enough to characterize what is demanded in the way of virtue mm -hmm. in a political society i.e. it is not the fulsome concept of moral virtue that we might want to import from Aristotle or the Christian tradition, but it is such a concept of virtue as provides some confidence in human beings being able to conduct themselves with an ordinary sense of justice. And that's why he emphasizes that so powerfully, and that's why at the heart of the book, the center of the book, he is four square announces an opposition to slavery, the subjection of women, and political servitude. That's the very center of the book. So we know where he's going, what he's trying to accomplish, and we must see these other principles in light of that goal. Wow. Well, you just introduced these crucial uh, distinctions. What, what a illuminating one between uh, controlling power and separating authorities, and how important to learn about the connection between Montesquieu thought crimes and freedom of conscience, and the idea that uh, prudence rather than Roman virtue is is enough. Uh, and and then uh, you've now introduced his opposition to slavery and the subjugation of women and political equality, which I must ask you about, Diana Schaub. And and um, <laughs> this, there's so much to tie together, but I know you each of you can do it. This may be the last round of interventions in this remarkable discussion, but I, I, I would love your thoughts um, about the connection between Montesquieu and separation of powers and the independent judiciary, which was the other big institution that you put on the table. Uh, such a crucial insight in the history of political theory that you need an independent judiciary to enforce 
separation of powers. What was Montesquieu's unique contribution on that score? And if you can help us understand how that connected to his thoughts about equality, opposition to slavery, and the subjugation of women, so much the better. Uh, that is too big a question for me. <laughs> Uh, can, can, can I take just a slightly different tack, which Please, will and whatever you maybe, think is best, maybe come around to it? Uh, I'm I'm just uh, you know struggling with the fact that I can't say separation of powers anymore. I have to say separation <laughs> of authority. Uh, so I'm I'm going I'm going to try to do that. Uh, so th this this begins as a response to Dennis, uh, who I think has really explained how and why the anti-federalists um, you know would would lay claim to Montesquieu. Uh, but I want to sort of sharpen that criticism that uh, that the Federalists make of the Anti-Federalists. Uh, they criticize the opponents of the Constitution for reading Montesquieu as a defender of that small virtuous republic, and they ignore his recommendation of confederations. I mean, if you really took Montesquieu seriously as a proponent or as holding to the view that only small republics can preserve liberty, you would actually have to break apart the existing states uh, because all of them at the time of the founding, and you know, at the time of the writing of the constitution were already well beyond the dimensions of a Greek polis. Uh, we would, Publius says, have to split ourselves into an infinity of little jealous clashing tumultuous commonwealths, the wretched nurseries of unceasing discord and miserable objects of universal pity and contempt. Um, so this, this is going to bring me to Tocqueville. I noticed there was a question about Tocqueville in, uh, in the Q&A uh, posted by some of the listeners. Uh, Tocqueville is really interesting here because he is the greatest fan of localism. You know, he writes beautifully about the spirit of the township, uh, you know, Puritan New England, uh, local government, local self-government. At the same time, he is a great admirer of the drafters of the Constitution. He was no anti-federalist. Uh, he, in fact, thought that the, that the states uh, were a potential threat. Uh, as they turned out to be in the, in the Civil War uh, to the maintenance of the Union. So uh, I, I think we could see then that the, the founders themselves, like Tocqueville, are not unconcerned with the character of citizens, but they expected it to be supported, you might say, extra constitutionally. In other words, at the level of the township, family, church, neighborhood, uh, you know, uh, active participation by citizens in self-government at the township level. Um, and that might be uh, <laughs> the way to get to uh, the, the point about women uh, and the liberty of women. Uh, it's certainly true that Montesquieu uh, is one of the great uh, advocates for women. Uh, I wrote initially on the Persian letters, which is sort of all about, uh, all about women and their role in the liberalization of political orders. Uh, uh, Tocqueville says, uh, in the end, to what would he attribute uh, the great success of the American Republic? Uh, it is to the superiority of its women. So somehow what happens, you know, at the level of the family, uh, that domestic realm, uh, there's some connection between domestic politics and politics proper. And that may also be a, a, a teaching that the, uh, that the founders learned from, from Montesquieu. It's certainly a point that he makes in the spirit of the laws. Wow, uh, just great um, connection between his uh, his localism and his uh, his devotion to to, to women's equality. Uh, Dennis Rasmussen, might you say another word about Montesquieu and the big small republic debate because it's so central, and because it was Hume who 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 was responding to Montesquieu about a large and small republic. I'll ask you also, because your book treats both Hume and Montesquieu, what differences there were among, uh, about their visions of commerce and, and virtue. Uh, Hume so famously also talked about interest and, and commerce as being a substitute for classical virtue. I wonder about similarities and differences uh, between the two. Well, Hume and Montesquieu both see commerce as an overwhelmingly beneficial thing. Um, 
I think it, but much of what they say fits very well with the, the argument we all know from Federalist 10 about the way commerce can increase the number of factions and then thereby help to, to solve the, if not solve the problem of faction, at least ameliorate the problem of faction. That too, of course, is part of this larger debate that we've touched on a number of times by now about the large and small republic, right? How can a large republic work? Well, we need the large size and the heterogeneity to, to solve the problem of faction. Let me back up. We've touched on this a number of times. What it is about the size, why small size seem to be so important. So Brutus, who was to my mind, the most powerful writer among the anti-federalists, cites Montesquieu, quotes him at length in his first paper about why we need small, why Republican government can only work in a small sized territory, a largely homogenous territory. The idea was if people are close together and very much like one another, then they'll identify with one another strongly. They'll identify more with their common government. They'll be more dedicated to that common government. The representatives will be able to truly know and represent the interests, the will of the people. Um, they won't feel themselves to be above the populace the way they might in a big, large, grand commercial republic. Um, and so the Federalists feel the need to, to take this, meet this argument head on. Um, as Bill Allen has very nicely said, uh, uh, in, I think two answers ago, Hamilton tries to do this in Federalist 9. He says, um, as Diana just said, well, you, you can't be reading Montesquieu very carefully if you say, well, we want to keep government in the this mostly uh, at the state level, um, and that satisfies Montesquieu's argument about size, because even Rhode Island and Delaware are bigger than, let's say, Athens or a Swiss canton, much less, you know, Pennsylvania or Virginia or something. Um, but he also says, and, and this too, I think we've, we've touched on, he says, keep reading, right? So Montesquieu seems to say you yeah. need a small republic in book eight, but then keep reading, keep reading the spirit of the laws in book nine, he says, a confederated republic is a way to deal with these problems of small republics, both external threats and, and internal problems. Um, and since this is my last, might be my last chance to, to say something here, let me just say just how remarkable it is that they're engaging in this very serious way, these very this very difficult thinker. Um, all of my, my co-panelists have written brilliantly and, and spoken brilliantly on, on Montesquieu, but it takes real scholarly work. I mean, there's not a <laughs> easy text to pick up and read and, and, and you know exactly what he's saying. The fact that these, you know, very engaged political actors, right, they're not political theory professors, they're engaged political actors, are engaging in a very serious way with this very difficult thinker. It's just remarkable. I, I You know, you try to think of an analog today, you think of members of Congress, right, pouring over the details of, of John Rawls's A Theory of Justice or something. It's almost impossible to imagine. Um, so it is, I'm not often one to engage in the kind of um, founders worship and, and, and so forth, but I do think this is a, a just a, shows something really important about the, the um, kind of level of the discourse of the day. Absolutely. Bravo. Well, it's such an important point to emphasize. Uh, the, the founders read deeply and they engaged with their reading. And this remarkable discussion shows how closely we have to engage with the text in order to understand it. I'm so grateful to be sharing this discussion with all the great listeners who are having such enthusiastic responses in the chat about how incredibly brilliant and illuminating this conversation is. And Dennis Rasmussen, you remind us that this was the level of discourse, uh, philosophical and political, that the founders themselves engaged in. Uh, Thomas Pang will you know, br bring us home as, as you think best, but among the questions I'd love to hear your thoughts on are, uh, Montesquieu's vision of human nature and how it influenced mm. the founders. And I must ask, because you've just you have a book on Rousseau, who was so much more optimistic about democracy than Hume. Um, and the founders divided so closely on the question of their own optimism about democracy based on their own vision of human nature. W where does Montesquieu's vision of human nature? fall? How does that influence his vision on, about democracy? And how did that influence the founders? Well, he is very emphatically a state of nature theorist. He begins the spirit of the laws by insisting that by nature, human beings are not social, although they need society because uh, their nature is very impoverished. And this goes with uh, a very strong tendency in Montesquieu 
to see most of our humanity as constructed by cultural history and therefore as highly diverse. He is very pessimistic about the idea of spreading liberal constitutionalism across the globe. I think he makes it clear that it is almost impossible that it's likely to spread into Africa or Asia. I think he's very doubtful about South America. It's a very rare breed, partly because humans are not by nature, uh, very well directed towards much of anything, according to Montesquieu. Um, and therefore, most of political life is an attempt to uh, repair or overcome or supplement the impoverishment of human nature. So he's very much in the tradition of Hobbes and Locke uh, and the other state of nature theorists, and to some extent, Rousseau in that regard. Uh, and and, uh, and that, of course, is something that um, uh, is, is, is extremely controversial. The one other thing I'd like to talk about, since we're on now a, a more general level, is this fact. Montesquieu's idea of the separation of powers has not worked well in history. Almost no successful republic in Western Europe, here in Canada, in the British Empire, in India, in England itself, has followed the separation of powers. Instead, what has been much more successful is the parliamentary system or the Westminster system as it's called, which depends very strongly on parties competing. And political parties are something that the founders simply don't know anything about. They're shocked by them, as someone has mentioned here. They're very pessimistic. Good heavens, we have political parties. This looks terrible. Jefferson hoped very strongly when he was inaugurated that that would be the end of it, that there would no longer be political parties. Uh, and that very much comes to some extent out of the hopes they had for the separation of powers. And what actually happened in most of history, starting in England, which abandoned the separation of powers uh, almost you know, soon after, uh, starting almost soon after Montesquieu died, and shifted to party government, the two-party system, and the idea that real checks and balances comes from competing political parties and all the passions and the interests that come from that, not from this institutional attempt to split up the powers or authorities of government and make them somehow the, uh, you know, the real engines of checks and balances. So there's an important way in which the parliamentary system goes back more to Aristotle and the classical philosophers, who also had no separation of authorities, but were very interested in conflicts among uh, classes and political parties gathered around classes. So I think that broader picture is an important one to keep in mind that um, really it's only in the United States that the separation of powers has been very successful. And of course, it's only been successful because it's had this massive supplement that was not foreseen by the founders and even horrified them, the two-party system. And to some extent, other parties, but usually minority parties you know, don't, don't work out. Uh, and that has been the real engine to some extent or to a large extent, and some would argue much more than the separation of powers, of protecting our liberties and our, our political life. So there's a very important argument there that has to be in mind in the background here. Thank you so much for helping us understand Montesquieu within the natural rights tradition of Locke. And, and you, you, you put Rousseau in that tradition as well. And also emphasizing the relationship between parties and the separation of powers. Um, uh, Professor Allen, the last word in this remarkable discussion is to you. Uh, I don't know if you want to say another word about the separation of authorities and, um, and, and Montesquieu's relation to it, but I'll just end by asking you to sum up as you think best about what, what the founders learned from Montesquieu and why our listeners should care about his legacy today. Well, the best way for me to handle that is to uh, resume the discussion about um, natural human nature, natural rights. The very first sentence in my commentary, which is forthcoming, is a sentence that remarks the silence in the spirit of the laws on John Locke, which requires explanation. And I go on to explain it, because he is not 
a natural rights or state of nature theorist. He is really quite, and he explicitly, of course, criticizes Hobbes in the spirit of laws for that very posture. But he recognizes the deficiencies of human circumstances, deficiencies that result from the interruption of their sociality. Now, I don't mean sociality in the sense of communities formed from the beginning. I mean sociality in the sense of people naturally attracted to one another and forming societies. That's how he describes it. But he also describes what we might think of as a cancer at the heart of that initial instinct. And that cancer is power. And so all of the discussion of human society is, in his eyes, a discussion of how to deal with the cancer of power, which interrupts, in fact, human sociality. Now, looking at it from that perspective, everything that we have talked about is a further development of that initial position that Montesquieu lays out with great clarity in the first book of The Spirit of the Laws. Now, I also refer to him as relying upon some Lockean principles in the course of the commentary. And so the reason he's silent about Locke seems to have less to do with any antipathy to Lockean liberalism, which I don't at all maintain he has, as to his refusal to stand on the foundation of Hobbes and Locke in order to achieve that objective. And so it takes a very subtle reading to see that what Montesquieu is doing is engaging us in reflections that are not captured by historical developments, but rather captured by a sense of the precariousness of human sociality and the need, therefore, to think through how we're going to deal with that. You can't extirpate the cancer, but you can potentially control it. And the spirit of the laws is about how to control the cancer of power. Bravo. Uh, the response to this panel in the Q&A box is overwhelmingly enthusiastic. Uh, cheers for assembling such a marvelously well-spoken and thoughtful panel. Uh, uh, friend Tim Garten says, great panel, what are next steps for continuing to learn? And uh, I know that everyone who's part of this discussion will feel lucky to have spent the past hour learning from such brilliant scholars in such a spirit of seeking the truth about the crucial influence of Montesquieu on the founders and his relevance today. I, the next step is to reassemble this group for further learning about the thinkers um, who influenced the founders, who are in our founders library. And I can't wait to find the best opportunity to do that soon. In the meantime, thanks to all of you, uh, Professor Diana Schaub, Dennis Rasmussen, Thomas Pangle, and William Allen for a discussion that none of us who are lucky enough to be part of it will ever forget. Thanks to 